Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, host of Relationship and Truth. And today I decided to go ahead and do a video for you guys. Now, technically speaking, I promised that I would do another YouTube video if uh, I got 205 likes on the Relationship and Truth Facebook page and I got 200, not 205. But hey, 200 is an even number, so might as well go ahead and do it, right? Well, that was at least my thinking. I don't know if that's good or not. But hey, we'll go ahead and we'll do this, and hopefully you guys will get something out of it. Today I'm going to be reviewing an article that was put out by Answers in Genesis. And the title of the article is, is as follows. About 6,000 years or 10,000 years, does it matter? This... And now, I, before I, I get into too much here, I want you guys to understand that I am very much so a fan of Answers in Genesis. I appreciate a lot of what they've done, and I recommend their material very frequently. However, that being said, I do have some points of disagreement with them, and this article brought out um, a couple of those points of disagreement. And ultimately, they are both issues of textual criticism. And the reason why I wind up disagreeing with them on these issues is simply because Answers in Genesis is not a, a text-critical institution. And frankly, I would really prefer that they stay out of that business because that is um, not what they do. It's not really what any of their areas of expertise are. And um, they just really, 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 really shouldn't be getting into it. But nonetheless, let's go ahead and get into the issue. There's two uh, sections I wanted to look at. One is a, a paragraph and the other is a, a fairly lengthy section that I wanted to look at. Um, the main point behind this article, just in case you're wondering, is basically um, answers in Genesis justifying uh, why they prefer to say that the Earth is about 6,000 years old rather than saying somewhere between six and 10,000 years old. And some of the points that they make, I completely agree with. Um, 10,000 years would be a little bit more of an inflation, and it would require putting a lot of different uh, people into the gene genealogies that we find in Genesis in, in, in the Bible. And so, of course, that would create some problems, to say the least, uh, when you're inserting uh, many, many, many people there. And so I can understand their concerns on that one. Um, but... They also um, wind up cutting out some good evidence for the um, for people, good Christian folks, young Earth creationists, who claim that the Earth um, may indeed be a little bit older than six thousand years. It could actually be somewhere between um, seventy uh, three hundred years and seventy four hundred years old. Um, according to some estimates. And let me go ahead and, and reveal where that comes in. That's this first paragraph that I wanted to talk about. Okay, so Bodhi Hodge is the author here, and he writes, You can try to get an extra thousand years or so from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, known as the LXX, Septuagint, which was translated just over 2,000 years ago, but it has glitches. For instance, if you add up the translation's inflated ages in Genesis, Methuselah lived for about a decade after the flood without being on the ark. But that is about the extent of it. You don't even come close to 10,000 years. So here, like I said before, he's trying to explain why we say 6,000 years, not 10,000 years. And he says you can get a little bit more out of the Septuagint. Uh, but it still doesn't get you close to 10,000 years. And I agree with him on that one. 10,000 years would still be an inflated number. My problem, though, is that he and the folks at Answers in Genesis, in fact, a lot of my fellow biblical uh, creationists, uh, tend to pass over the Septuagint somewhat glibly. And frankly, uh, they show a lot of bias and even bigotry towards the Septuagint sometimes. And this article is a perfect example of that. Notice the way that uh, Bodhi introduces the Septuagint. Um, he talks about it being a translation, which in and of itself isn't a bad thing. But when he talks about it again, 
Um, and again, he keeps talking about it as a translation. He keeps trying to get reinforce this idea. Not just that it's a version, but it's a translation, it's a translation, it's a translation. Why, why in just this one little paragraph does he emphasize that it's a translation so much? Simply because he is trying to dissuade his reader from taking the Septuagint seriously. Well, it's a translation, so it's you know indirectly related to the original text, therefore it's not reliable. Um, that's a load of hogwash, frankly. Um, just because something is a translation doesn't mean that it can't accurately represent the original. Most people today use a translation of the Bible, and you wouldn't say, well, it's a translation, so you shouldn't trust it at all. Now, granted that it's a translation, there are going to be certain limitations that it has. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, translations do have some limitations, but just because it's a translation doesn't mean that it necessarily got things wrong. Another thing that concerns me about the way he introduces it is the age that he gives. When he says that it was translated about 2,000 years ago, that is, as a round number, true, but he leaves out a really important detail. Uh, the Septuagint was actually translated, especially at least uh, the books of the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy. They were translated before the time of Christ. And we actually have 2nd century BC, 2nd century before the time of Christ, manuscripts of books of the law um, for the Septuagint. This is a really, really old translation that existed prior to the time of Christ. And it was a translation that the New Testament authors referred to very commonly. For example, the Apostle John uses the Septuagint all over the place in his writings. And, and very specifically, the Septuagint and not other versions. He's, um, he uses the Septuagint even where it differs with the Hebrew text that we have now. And he is an inspired author. I think he would know what is appropriate to use and what isn't. Now, I'm not saying that the Septuagint as it's commonly used today is accurate in all cases. Believe me, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying, though, is that it is very much so ancient, and it does have readings in it that Christ's apostles did favor. And that means that it's at least worth looking at, if nothing else. And, it, and the age that he chose here... Um, and saying it was just over 2,000 years ago that it was translated is rounding the age down. It would really be more accurate to say that it was, you know, about 22 or possibly even 2,300 years ago that it was translated. That would be more accurate. Um, instead, he rounds it down in order to try to discredit it is really what it comes to. And then he says it has glitches. And he says, for example, if you add up the translations, that is that word again, translation, not just simply a version and not a really, and he doesn't say uh, this extremely early translation. He doesn't preface it that way. It's just a translation. And then he basically just tries to poison the well for the reader here. And he says the translations inflated ages. He is putting that out there without any proof whatsoever that the ages are inflated. And he says that if you follow the ages that it gives you, then you have Methuselah living until a decade after the flood, uh, despite not being in the ark, at least according uh, to the count as we have it. It doesn't mention Methuselah being in the ark at all. It specific, uh, the Bible as a whole specifically says that there are eight on board the ark. Noah and his wife, the three sons and their wives. That's all that it says. So, obviously that's uh, a problem, of course. Um, but what he doesn't mention here is that his favored version of the text, which is the Masoretic version of the text, also has problems. In fact, every single version of the Genesis account has some problems in it. And that happens when you have a text that is over 2,000 years old. The Hebrew version, we have um, the Dead Sea Scrolls for that that go back to before the time of Christ, for a second century before the time of Christ. And we even have fragmentary uh, metal manuscripts, uh, manuscripts in silver and other such things that go back even before that, I think as early as the sixth century BC in the Hebrew version. Um, and also in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have evidence of another type, uh, text type that shows up, and that's the Samaritan Pentateuch. And all three of these versions of 
uh, the Genesis account have their issues, especially as it relates to the genealogy. And let me show you uh, that real quick here. Um, but my main problem with this particular paragraph is that uh, Bodhi and AIG have gone out of their way to slander the Septuagint and not give it its fair shake in comparison to all the others. They bring out problems with the Septuagint. They don't bring out any problems with the others. That is frankly academically dishonest. Now granted, this article was not meant to be exhaustive. It was not meant to go into all the details. So you have to take that into account. It wasn't meant to talk about everything. But there are claims here, like saying that the ages are inflated, for which no proof is given. Um, that's a bit of a problem, academically speaking. That's not intellectually honest. Like I said, it is a brief article. It's not meant to get into everything. So I'll give them some leeway on that one. But if you're going to make a claim, you have to have some kind of proof or at least some kind of a footnote that would go for it. You'll notice that nothing in this paragraph was footnoted at all. There is nothing to back up the claims here. And like I said, it's a short article, but still you would expect something. Uh, but while we're at it, let's go ahead and talk about um, some of the problems that you have with the various versions. Like I mentioned, there was the Samaritan Pentateuch. That is one version of the Genesis account uh, that is out there. And it's also one that pretty much everyone agrees is the least reliable of the three. And the basic reason for that is that even though there are some, there's some evidence for the Samaritan Pentateuch in things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and whatnot, uh, the problem is there's just been so much change uh, regarding the text and a lot of uh, and a lot of it was culturally motivated that if you remember the Old Testament and what's going on there towards the towards the end of the Old Testament period, you have Israel being sent off into exile. First, it's the uh, uh, the northern kingdom and then the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom gets replaced by these people that are taught to kind of reverence the Israeli uh, religion, but they mix a lot of their own religion with it, and they are the Samaritans. And um, so they they wind up having a, a version of the Old Testament, and specifically of the law, uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books, the Torah. Um, but their their version has a lot of their own cultural things in it. For example, they um, and declare that God told them that they were to worship basically in their own land up there in Israel instead of down in, in Judah, and that there's a specific mountain that they're supposed to go to and all those kinds of things, and they edited the, the text that way. And so when you have culturally motivated readings, it's a little hard to be completely... Um, um, completely unbiased regarding the text, to, to say the least. That makes things a little bit difficult. Okay, but um, when you're looking through the Samaritan Pentateuch and its and genealogy, one of the things that you notice uh, right off the bat that should catch your eye is that three people die in the exact same year as the flood. There's Jared, Methuselah, and Lamech, and they all wind up dying in the exact year of the flood. And yet it's not mentioned in the text at all. It doesn't say, oh, and by the way, these... Um, ancestors of Noah um, were judged along with the, the rest of the earth and so they died in the flood you know you would think that that would be a detail that would show up in the text if that was true you know you would have remembered seeing grandpa you know floating out there in the in the flood waters you know seeing him drowning out there that that would have been merit worthy you know somebody would have written that down you would think if that happened uh, but yeah, there's no mention in the text at all, and yet the Samaritan Pentateuch version puts three people dying uh, that are in a Noah's lie. It puts them all dying in the flood, which would indicate that they died under judgment in the flood. Um, then yeah, that poses some problems when it's not mentioned otherwise. In fact, what appears to be, happen is that the... Um, the uh, genealogy actually looks like it's been smushed down in the, the pre-flood uh, part of it. That is, you notice after the flood, it becomes relatively steep, which is what you would normally expect to see in a genealogy. You'd expect more or less a straight line um, from one corner to the other of a graph uh, like this. But this one has some interesting bent behavior. Instead, it's really shallow for a while, and then it curves, and then it, well, not curves, it pretty much bends upward uh, after the flood.
which would indicate that what happened is that the ages at procreation before the flood got cut down. And so what happened is what used to be fairly steep, and you'd have the the flood line would actually used to be higher up, but once the ages at procreation got cut down, it brought the flood closer. And so some people outlived the flood. And what that means is that the editors of the text went back and they cut the ages down uh, so that they didn't live past uh, the flood. And so you get total ages for Jared, uh, Methuselah, and Lamech that you don't get in any other versions of the text. Um, they are flood stopped. That's a bit of a problem. Uh, like I said, you would expect those kinds of things to show up in the text. Someone would mention that, you know, hey, uh, grandpa is out there in the water, treading water out there, you know, and, and so is gr uh, great grandpa, and also great great grandpa is out there, you know. You, you'd think that'd show up in the text, but it doesn't. Whenever you have a historically significant event in people's lives interacting in a big way with that event, but it not getting mentioned in any of the his Germain historical record, that is really suspicious. Mm -hmm. So the Samaritan Pentateuch as being completely reliable is off the, off the shelf right from the get-go because it has flood stoppages. Now the Masoretic text, which Answers in Genesis prefers, actually has the exact same problem and another one on top of it. That is, they have flood stoppage as well with Methuselah. In the Masoretic text, Methuselah dies in the exact uh, year of the flood, just like he dies in the exact year of the flood in the Samaritan Pentateuch. Now, it's not as extensive a problem because the Masoretic text in its pre-flood sequence is a little bit steeper than the Samaritan Pentateuch is. You can see how shallow the Samaritan Pentateuch is and how the, the Masoretic text gets a little bit steeper. And so it doesn't have as much of a problem with flood stoppage, um, but it does occur with Methuselah. His age is flood stopped. And so, yeah, that's a little bit of a problem, to say the least. So that would be an indicator that there's a problem there as well. But again, this pre-flood sequence is probably too shallow still. It's not as shallow as the Samaritan Pentateuch one, but it's still probably too shallow. And then after the flood, you get some really weird things going on. In the Samaritan Pentateuch, you see how the after-flood sequence was fairly steep. Uh, and this is what you would expect a, a genealogy to do. You'd expect it to actually progress through history, onward and upward. But the Masoretic genealogy doesn't do that. It doesn't go onward and upward. Instead, it just kind of trails off to the right at more or less the same level uh, for quite a ways. In fact, as far as total lifespan is concerned, the Masoretic uh, uh, chronology actually goes backwards for nine generations from Shem. That is, Shem winds up living long enough to bury not just his child, not just his grandchild, not just his great-grandchild, and his great-great-grandchild, and his great-great-great-grandchild, and his great-great-great-great-grandchild, but he winds up outliving nine successive generations. Have you known anyone who has outlived nine subsequent generations? I mean, you gotta feel sorry for Shem if that's the case, that he outlived his great, 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 great grandson. He had to bury them all. He was alive for their deaths, every single one of them. Does anyone here think that that's a little suspicious? And yes, he lived for a long time. But that's still not what you would expect in a genealogy. Yes, sometimes a, a father will outlive his son, which is tragic always. Uh, but generally, that's not how uh, genealogies go. Yes, you might li outlive one, sometimes two generations, but not nine. Even with uh, ages as large as these, you know, Shem living 600 years, you still wouldn't expect it to happen uh, like that. Uh, like I said, it's basically going the wrong direction through history for most of the, the period until we get to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then it starts going onward and upward from there. But before that, it's actually going backwards through history as far as age at death is concerned. So the Masoretic text has some major problems too. Okay, We have flood stoppage, just like with the Samaritan Pentateuch, and then also winds up actually trailing downwards for a while through history before it starts picking up again. That is extremely unusual behavior for any real population. You wouldn't expect uh, 
uh, someone to outlive nine subsequent generations under any ordinary circumstances, even if they are very long-lived. Now, here's the Septuagint, the one that answers in Genesis hates so much. Here you do have uh, occasions where people will outlive the next generation. That does happen from time to time, but not nine subsequent generations. And also, no one in the Septuagint is flood stopped. You don't have anyone editing the text to make sure that no one outlives the flood. What does that mean? What uh, that means is that there was not a whole lot of wholesale editing that happened with the Septuagint once it was made. It's relatively pure. Now, there is some interesting things that go on. In the Septuagint, there is an extra uh, Canaan. This one's uh, Kenan because I'm using a, a different version of the text. But there's an extra Kenan or Kynan, or, or Canaan, depending on how you want to pronounce it, uh, that shows up in the Septuagint chronology. This this extra person who's inserted in there. And then uh, Methuselah, like the uh, Answers in Genesis article mentioned, does wind up outliving the flood by 14 years, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, that's a little bit of a problem, to say the least. Yeah, 14 years is a little long. Okay, so those are uh, problems, and it would indicate that, you know, if you do take the uh, Genesis as literal history that there really was a flood that wiped out everyone except for Noah and his family and you have someone out living past it, yeah, that's going to be a bit of an issue. Um, so yeah, there's problems with all three of the major forms and it turns out that these problems with under uh, the auspices of textual criticism actually are all reconcilable and you can create an adjusted patriarchal chronology that's largely going to be based on the Septuagint. Um, because the Septuagint is the one that is actually the most accurate in that it doesn't have the weird things going on in the tail end that the Masoretic text has, and it doesn't have the uh, the flood stopped ages that the Septuagint or the, sorry, not the Septuagint, but the Samaritan Pentateuch or the Masoretic text had. Um, you have the textual variant of the extra uh, uh, Kynan and uh, the problem with Methuselah, but other than that, it's a relatively clean uh, version of the text and you can create a chronology based on it using information from all the other sources and using the principles of textual criticism that get you back to a very accurate version of the text. And this is actually from a document that I made um, a while back which specifically addressed uh, this issue and all the, the issues that go on there and create a chronology based on that. Um, but yeah, what Answers in Genesis did in their article is they poisoned the well against the Septuagint uh, without offering any real uh, proof to that effect. I mean, yes, they talk about uh, Methuselah living past the flood, but they don't mention any of the issues that exist with the Masoretic text. They don't mention that Shem outlives the ninth generation after him. They don't mention that Methuselah is flood stopped in uh, the Masoretic text just like he is in the Samaritan Pentateuch. Um, all of the versions have their issues, and that's why we need to do textual criticism to reconcile them. No one version by itself is likely to be correct in every single case. And that's why we need textual uh, criticism so that we can correct all the different problems in all the different versions, which is what I did in that article. And I'll probably go ahead and post um, a link to that in this video once I'm done making it here. All right, so that's the first issue that I wanted to talk about. And then... Uh, the second issue that I wanted to talk about uh, starts here and basically goes on from there. But let's go ahead and begin. Then to wrap up the article, uh, Bodhi Hodge says, the genealogies are very specific in giving the age of the earth when the sun is born. However, in some translations of Luke 3.36, there seems to be an extra uh, Canaan or Kynan or Kenan, depending on how you want to spell it and pronounce it. Uh, because of this, some have proposed that there may be gaps in the genealogies. However, one needs to understand this specific instance better. And then he's going to go ahead and cite someone. But before we get into that citation, I wanted to point out how he basically tries to dissuade his audience and frankly misrepresents the, the situation here. He says, some translations of Luke 3.36. Some translations. Uh, 
Well, let's look up some of the major translations here and see, you know, which ones don't have this extra kinin in them. Right here we have the English Standard Version of 336. It has the kinin in it. Here's the Holman Christian Standard Bible has the uh, kinin in it. Here is the Net Bible has the kinin in it. Here is the American Standard Bible has the kinin in it. Here is the Geneva Bible, which would follow with the King James and other earlier translations like that, has the kinin in it, or the Kenan, or the Canaan, or however you want to pronounce it. Every single major version that is out there, and this would also hold for the NIV as well, just in case you're curious, every single major version that is out there has the Kainan. So why is it that Bodhi said some translations of Luke 3.36 have this? I don't know of any major translation that doesn't. Why did he say it this way? It's because he's trying to create doubt in the reader's mind as to the authenticity of this variant before he actually explains anything about it. Okay, this and uh, the uh, colloquial phrase for that is poisoning the well. Trying to create a bad image of something before you've actually given any evidence to that effect. Um, and frankly, a lot of people do uh, will do this. Some people are just a little bit more honest about it. They'll say, I'm in favor of this and not these other things, and here's why. And as long as you're upfront about it, most of the time in academic circles, it's considered to be acceptable. However, when you do it on the sly, uh, like this, where you're not coming out and saying uh, it directly, but instead you're doing, well, some translations do it this way, which is all major translations, it becomes a little bit of an issue, to say the least. It's not exactly forthcoming and honest. If he were to do this proportionally, he would say, however, every major translation of Luke 30, uh, in every uh, major translation of Luke 3.36, there seems to be an extra Canaan, or Canaan, or Kenan, however you want to say it. He doesn't say that, though. Instead, he says some. That's misleading. He's not saying... I believe that this extra uh, canon is wrong and here's why. Instead, he throws in this detail that isn't really accurate. And this is something that frustrates me about Answers in Genesis. Lots of the stuff that Answers in Genesis puts out is actually pretty solid and I recommend it to people. And even after this, I'm not going to stop recommending that people use Answers in Genesis because they still have really good things. But they do have biases biases which prevent them from dealing with certain things as honestly as they should. And this is one of those things. They are not skilled or well-versed in textual criticism, and it shows. They just see problems and they reach in and say, okay, we're going to fix this so that it matches what we wanted to say, basically. But what is the main issue that um, Bodhi is trying to get at here? Well, what he's getting at is that in the New Testament, there is a Canaan that shows up, or a Canaan or a Canaan that shows up that you do not find in the Old Testament. And like I said, here's the, the Masoretic chronology. And after uh, Arpaxad, Arpax or however you want to say it, there's no Canaan in the standard Hebrew version. Uh, you do get it in the Septuagint version, but you don't get it in earlier versions of the Septuagint, by the way, uh, like Julius Africanus and also, as far as I know, um, Josephus. Josephus used a version of the Septuagint, which, by the way, he does not mention um, that Josephus' chronology actually matches up with the Septuagint than it does better, more so than it does with the, the Masoretic text. He leaves that part out. Um, but yeah, there's this extra Kenan that shows up here, but like I said, it isn't in earlier versions of the Septuagint, and that's why when you do the adjustment, uh, the extra Kenan or Kainan doesn't show up there, because it's not in the earlier versions. Um, but yeah, the issue is that in Luke, though, there is definitely that extra Kenan. You can see it in all the major translations, and... It would, on the surface, it seems to indicate that the genealogy back in Genesis is wrong. Luke records someone that Genesis doesn't. Well, does that mean that the Genesis account in the Masoretic text got it wrong? Well, like I said, the Genesis text, as per the Hebrew Masoretic text, isn't all that accurate anyways. It's the one 
that had the weird funky stuff going on with the trail uh, on the tail end where Shem winds up living, outliving nine subsequent generations. So uh, does what's going on in Luke prove that the Masoretic text is an error? Not actually. There's actually a lot more that's going on in that. But in Bodhi's mind and in Answers in Genesis' mind, um, they think that that is a major issue, that Luke's genealogy has to match up with the Genesis genealogy, and so we have to figure out some reason, uh, some means by which we can get rid of this extra Canaan. And so that's what he is going to do now. He's going to prove that the extra Canaan is a problem. And so he calls in his expert witness here, and he calls in the expositor Dr. John Gill. Now, for any of you guys who know your basic church history, you'll already spot that there's a little bit of a problem here. Dr. John Gill lived in the 1700s. A lot of the major discoveries as far as textual manuscripts are concerned for the New Testament, a lot of those major discoveries happened in the 1800s and 1900s. So you're going to pull from someone um, who was writing before a lot of the major discoveries were made. That's going to be a little bit of a problem here. But what is it that Dr. John Gill has to say? He says, this Kynan is not mentioned by Moses in Genesis 11:12, nor has he ever appeared in any Hebrew copy of the Old Testament, nor in the Samaritan version, nor in the Targum, nor is he mentioned by Josephus, nor in 1 Chronicles 1:24, where the genealogy is repeated, nor is it in Beza's most ancient Greek copy of Luke. It indeed stands in the present copies of the Septuagint, but it was not originally there, and therefore could not be taken uh, by Luke from thence, but seems to be owing to some early negligent transcriber of Luke's gospel, and since put it in the Septuagint to give it authority. I say early because it is in many Greek copies and in the Latin Vulgate, and all the Oriental versions, even the Syriac, the oldest of them but ought not to stand neither in the text nor in any version, for certain it is, there never was such a Kynan, the son of Arphaxad, for Sala was his son, and with him the next word should be connected. So that is what Dr. John Gill had to say about the issue, um, basically. Um, but like we mentioned before, Dr. John Gill lived before a lot of the major discoveries were made. And there's a lot of information here um, that simply bears a little bit of fleshing out. So since a lot of the, the discoveries have been made, we have the two earliest unsealed manuscripts being published in the 1800s. That would be Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. And then we also have um, the a lot of the papyri being discovered in the uh, early 1900s and continuing, but a lot of them in the 1900s is when the, the papyri uh, were began to be discovered. Um, how does that change things here? Now do we have many more uh, manuscripts? Well, no, we don't. There's actually only two manuscripts, um, two manuscripts total in any version, in any language, that do not have the Kynan. And one of them, um, Dr. John Gill does point out correctly, and that is Beza's most ancient Greek copy of Luke. Let's go ahead and highlight that. Does anyone know out there what Beza's most ancient Greek copy of Luke was? Well, it wasn't very inventively named. It was called Codex Beza because it was Beza's. And it is a 5th century manuscript, but it is not a very reliable one, especially when it comes to this kind of stuff. If you look at the genealogy of Luke and Codex Bizet, it's actually in reverse order. They re, the, uh, the scribes who put together Codex Bizet reordered the text and changed it. And then if you look in other places in Codex Bizet, you find these weird random insertions all over the place that could uh, include all these little traditional tidbits um, that were taken basically from uh, folklore. For example, it records, I think it is in Acts chapter 12, 
where it talks about um, Peter uh, being miraculously released from prison, Codex Bizet tells us that it was like seven steps that he walked down. It gives us the specific number of uh, steps. It's just weird and idiosyncratic. Um, and then, uh, getting back to uh, Luke in the genealogy, not only does it reorder it, but it takes Luke's genealogy and it edits out things. It cuts things out to make it match Matthew's gospel. Because in Matthew, Matthew also gives a genealogy for Christ, um, but in Matthew, he skips a few generations here and there, which answers in Genesis in this particular article uh, doesn't talk about a whole lot. That is, Matthew, when he wrote his genealogy for Jesus, he broke it down into sets of 14. And there is a reason why he did that. He was trying to uh, basically make a symbolic point that Jesus is the Messiah, the heir of David. And in Hebrew, um, David's name has a, a gematria representation of 14. And so to symbolically make his point, Matthew left some names out of his uh, genealogy so that it would be broken down into sets of 14, and he could make his symbolic point. Well, in Codex Bizet, Bayes' most ancient copy of Luke, um, Luke's genealogy was edited to match Matthew's. Uh, things would be cut out, things would be reordered, those kinds of things, and names that differed in those kinds of things would be rearranged in um, uh, swapped out because there's a lot of uh, Matthew and uh, Luke uh, that once it gets down to Christ that don't agree with each other. The scribe of Codex Bizet felt that he needed to help the texts out and make them match each other, both in the order that were, they were given and, into, and as far as specific content was concerned. Um, so that is the only evidence that Dr. Uh, John Gill was aware of that did not have the kinin in it. And it is one of the most unreliable texts on the face of the planet that was very heavily edited in that particular area. And so it is not reliable when it comes to that. Just because it doesn't have the kinin doesn't mean that the kinin doesn't exist. What it means is that Beza's scribe um, was trying to basically create what he thought the genealogy should be. Now, does Dr. John Gill point that out? No. Does Bodhi Hodge, who's quoting Dr. Jill, uh, John Gill, uh, point that out at all? No. Does Answers in Genesis uh, talk about these kinds of issues? No. Instead, they go to someone who lived at a very early point, who very obviously did not have firsthand knowledge of what Codex Bizet was like, who didn't realize that Codex Bizet was very, very, very heavily edited at this particular point and therefore not reliable. But has the situation changed? Do we have any more manuscripts than Codex Bizet that don't have the kind in them? Yes, we do. We have one Codex, uh, not Codex, uh, but one unsealed papyrus manuscript that does not have uh, the kind in it. And it's this one right here, P75. P75 is an early manuscript. This is true. It's either late second century or early third century, depending on how you date it and who's doing the dating and that kind of thing. And we could have a very long discussion about how papyrus manuscripts are dated, um, but that's not really relevant here. The point is that we have one other manuscript that does not have the kind in it, but there's a problem here. P75, for the most part, is actually a pretty um, accurate manuscript, but there's a little, more than a little bit of a problem when we get uh, to this particular area. P75, when we're talking about Luke, and especially the early chapters of Luke, is very fragmentary and frankly has a somewhat muddled text. And so, yes, it does not have the kainan in it, but that's only as far as we can tell. You look it up in a lot of the, the critical uh, apparatus uh, that are out there, especially the one for the Nestle Allen 28th and things like that, and it'll say P75 vid, V-I-D, which is a Latin abbreviation, which means this is the apparent reading. Uh, we can't actually make out what the text says here, but it's our guess that it doesn't have the kind in there. And they do it based on word links and uh, those kinds of things. Let me see if I can actually bring up a picture of what is going on there. Yes, NTM. What in the world? CSNTM.org. Uh, this is the... Uh, the materials that 
actually I'm not going to go into that because I know there's um, um, a licensing th uh, thing in a, a, a user agreement that you have to go with. So I'm not going to do that. It would have been fun, but we won't do that. Because um, I don't want to get in trouble and I don't want to violate the, the terms of use on that particular website. Um, it's meant for private viewing. It's not meant for public viewing. Um, but anyways, P75 is very fragmentary. And so they don't actually know what the reading is at Luke 336. It's just their best guess, essentially based on word, word links and things like that, that it doesn't have it there. So those are the two manuscripts that you have that are in favor of answers in Genesis reading that the Canaan wasn't there. You have Codex Bizet, in which the genealogy was heavily edited and changed, and therefore not reliable, and P75, which is fragmentary and basically unreadable at that point, and they made a guess, and their guess says that it doesn't have it. Those are the only two witnesses that they have that do not have the Kainan in there, and they're not good witnesses. Okay. Now, is any of this brought out? Um, no. Instead, Bodhi has chosen to use one of the oldest uh, sources that he could pull up, Dr. John Gill from the 1700s, um, and he's pulling up someone who is very obviously not as familiar uh, with the text as he could be, and makes rather bold assertions without um, good evidence for it. In the modern uh, we have discovered lots of other early evidence as well that supports the reading of Kiting. There's P4, for example, which is just as old as P75. It's either a, a late 2nd century or early 3rd century manuscript, and it has the Kiting in it. Um, there's also manuscripts 0, 01, 02, and 03, which are all early manuscripts. 01 is Codex Sinaiticus from the 4th century, 02 is Codex Vaticanus. Uh, from the 4th century, and 03 is Alexandrinus, which is from the 5th century, and it's a contemporary of Codex Bizet. And so the vast majority of the early manuscripts actually do have the Kainan in there, and the early reliable ones all have the Kainan. And Codex Bizet at this point is not reliable. It's very edited in the genealogy. And then, like I said, P75 is actually unreadable at that particular point. So it's not, it, and if you can't read it, it's not going to be reliable either. So as far as the early, early and reliable manuscripts are concerned, they all have uh, the Kainan in them, all of them. And then, in fact, every other Germain Greek New Testament manuscript and every other Germain version has it. So, um, yeah, the odds of Dr. Gill being right here are pretty much zero. And then Bodhi goes on to say that this appears to have been one of a few copious mistakes that have crept into the manuscripts after Luke wrote the original inspired manuscript. Early Luke manuscripts do not have this reference. Early Luke manuscripts. In the evidence that he cited, he only mentioned one, Codex Bizet. Early Luke manuscripts. And it is technically true that there are two. There's Codex Bizet and then there's also um, P75. Um, two manuscripts, but neither of them are reliable. One of them is very heavily edited and was rearranged to match Matthew, that's Codex Bizet, and then the other one is basically unreadable at that point. And this is strong evidence. It's not strong, but this is how Bodhi is trying to put it forward. Early Luke manuscripts do not have this extra reference to Canaan. And he leaves out that um, that all of the other early manuscripts do have the reference to Canaan, including 02 and P4 and 01 and Z3, uh, 03. Um, this is not entirely academically honest. He's not presenting the, the full picture here. And like I said, this is a short little article, so he can't present everything, but it would be nice if he wasn't as misleading about it. It would be nice if he said, Two early Luke manuscripts do not have this reference to, uh, refer, reference to Canaan. And it would be even better if he said two out of, oh, let's see here. With counting Codex Bizet, we could say uh, one, two, three, four, 
five, and then with Codex Bizet would be six. It would be much more accurate if he said two early Luke Man uh, two early Luke manuscripts out of six uh, six total early manuscripts do not have this extra reference to Kynan. Do you see how that kind of changes the the flavor there a little bit? If he said that it was two out of six instead of just early Luke manuscripts. And then he says, others have pointed out how this error could have occurred rather easily. Um, you can create all kinds of reasons for why your particular favored variance shows up the way that it does, but that doesn't make it genuine. Um, you go ahead and actually look it up in their germane um, literature, uh, whether, you know, people like Metzger or Philip Comfort or Omanson or pretty much anyone um, that is actually in the field would actually cite any of their explanations that they would come up with as actually being legitimate. Granted, you're going to have a lot of interesting theories out there in internet land and things like that. And, but as far as them actually being something that you could take seriously, not so much, not so much. But getting back to the main point here, why is it that Bodhi is trying to disprove the second uh, Kynan? Why is he trying to prove that the second Kynan that shows up in Luke really isn't supposed to be there? Well, it has to do with this. He says, if one proposes gaps in Genesis 5, the chronological data in the Bible is false, and you are back to the same problem of having an untrustworthy Bible. There is no legitimate reason to introduce gaps into the genealogies other than the desire to extend the dates based on extra biblical ideas. Well, going with different versions of the text like the Septuagint isn't introducing extra biblical ideas. And um, paying attention to what the Gospel of Luke has to say in the uh, earliest and best manuscripts instead of the earliest unreliable manuscripts, uh, has to say is not something that's extra biblical. But what is the uh, the issue here? I'm I'm a young Earth creationist. Most people know that about me, and it's pretty obvious that this hasn't really bothered me any that the that Luke has an extra kind in it, and that's because I know a little bit about um, church history in general, and I know that uh, like I was mentioning before, that Luke, uh, sorry that. Um, Matthew cuts people out of his genealogy of Christ to make the point, the symbolic point, that Christ was the Messiah, uh, the dis promised descendant of David, the king, the anointed one. And so he takes his genealogy and he cuts it down to sets of 14. Whereas if you look it up in First Chronicles and places like that, it should actually be longer than 14 in some sections. Um, but Matthew cuts it down so that he can make his point. A similar thing is going on with Luke, but basically in reverse. Whereas Matthew cuts out people to make a symbolic point, Luke actually adds people in to make a symbolic point. And early Christians, like, say, uh, Irenaeus, for example, understood this. Um, early uh, Christians, like Irenaeus, cite uh, that the number of people in the genealogy of Christ is 72. Now, if you look it up in the earliest manuscripts that basically would have been more or less contemporary with folks like Irenaeus, um, you'll see that there are actually 77 total people listed, and yet Irenaeus says only 72. How is that? Uh, what's happening there? Well, Luke added people into his genealogy to get to 77 because he was trying to make a point about Christ. In biblical numerology, seven is usually taken as a sign of completeness and perfection. So by pushing it up to 77, he is giving Christ a number of completion, a com number of perfection. He's saying that we are made perfect in Christ, that Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He is the one who perfects us, whereas the law couldn't perfect us. It was a symbolic point that what Luke was making. Now, you have to remember, though, that Luke and Matthew are both making this, these points to people who would have known the genealogies. Uh, and certainly would have known the early genealogies and the genealogies that are found in Chronicles and places like that. They would have known these things. And so they make their adjustments where people already know what's going on. So Luke, he adds, um, actually, I think I have a list in my article of specifically what Luke adds. Let me see if I can bring this up, because I actually wrote this whole article on the whole issue of the chronology and things like that. And 
And let's see if I can remember where it is. Oh yeah, okay, so here, here we go. So the names that Luke added into his chronology are the races, Arababel, GLTL, Admin, and the second, uh, Kainan or Kenan. Those are the five extra folks that he added to get to the special number 77. Um, beyond what Irenaeus talks about as being 72. And by the way, he talks about that in Against Heresies uh, 3.22.3, uh, which was written, uh, written in the latter 2nd century. Um, but yeah, that was how it was understood to be. Early Christians understood that the genealogies in both Matthew and Luke um, served a literal and symbolic function. And so... Uh, they were edited accordingly. Matthew cut people out of his genealogy that would have been known from other texts. It wasn't like he was trying to hide anything. Uh, they would have known who these people were based on other texts in the Bible, whether it be Genesis or First Chronicles or things like that. So he cuts a few people out to go down to sets of 14. Luke does the opposite. He adds some people in who, again, were known from other texts in the, in the Bible. People would have been able to easily identify them and say that these people are added, and that's how it was understood early on. Irenaeus is really clear about the fact that it was only 72 literal gen generations, but you can look at the early manuscripts that were available in his time, and they say 77. It's really clear that they understood that this was a symbolic addition to the text. Okay. And that's what happens when you actually do historical research and you look up and actually see how these things were looking instead of trying to find an explanation that happens to fit the point that you're trying to make. Okay, there is a reason for why Luke has that extra kainan in there. He was making a symbolic point. He was trying to say, hey, Jesus is the perfection. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Um, it has absolutely nothing to do with saying that there are gaps in Genesis. That's not how the early Christians interpreted it at all, as proven by people like Julius Africanus and folks like that who made genealogies, and by the way, who did not have the extra kinin in there. Um, the best textual evidence that we have is that the extra kinin is indeed supposed to be in Luke, because Luke was making a specific symbolic point, and he was doing that knowing that it wasn't in Genesis, and that in no way uh, detracts from the accuracy of Genesis. Luke could only do what he did in making his symbolic point because people already knew what the literal genealogy was supposed to be based on Genesis. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to make his point in the same way with Matthew. Matthew was able to make his symbolic point of doing generation sets of 14 because people already knew what these early the early parts of these genealogies were supposed to be. Um, so yeah, there isn't any major contest there. Yes, the second Kainan is entirely authentic. It matches up with the known history very well. The problem, though, is that Answers in Genesis and Bodhi Hodge specifically um, just simply haven't done their research in uh, very thorough and honest ways. They pull really old sources, like Dr. John Gill, who's an author from the 1700s, who's writing with very limited information. Um, and they use language all over the place that is just so, like I said, it, it's a poisoning of the well. It's trying to get people to not think about these other things. And so they try to get people not to look at the Septuagint. And they never mention that their favorite text, the Masoretic text, has its own set of issues and that you actually need to do some more textual critical work. And they never bring up the fact that Bayes' most ancient copy of Luke um, was actually re-edited to match Matthew, and it was put in reverse order from what Luke normally is, that it was a heavily modified and edited text there. And that when we say early versions, uh, early manuscripts of Luke, that it's two out of six, and those two being unreliable. One because it was heavily modified, the other one because it's illegible. That's not brought out. Okay, this is stuff that bugs me when it comes to academic honesty. Answers in Genesis, I know they can do better than this, but they didn't. And most of their stuff, I still recommend rather heartily. Um, okay, in a lot of the areas, because they do have people on staff there that are experts in different areas. I mean, there's Dr. Andrew Snelling, who is a 
top class uh, geologists. You have Dr. Georgia Purdom, who knows bi microbiology very well. You have folks like that over there that are very much skilled in their particular areas, but I wish they would stop trying to do textual analysis because it is very clear that is not their area. They don't get into the history enough. Instead, what they do is they create, they they pick whatever their viewpoint is, and then they try to find evidence that matches that, and they exclude all other conversation, even if it's from other Christians like myself. And frankly, that's really frustrating and annoying. The odds of Answers in Genesis' chronology being exactly right is pretty much zero, because they don't look at other evidence from other sources, other Christian sources. And like I said, that bugs me. That really, really bugs me. If you're going to be academically honest, you have to be able to account for all of the germane data, and you have to be willing to admit where your own faults are. Bodhi was very, very, very quick to point out, you know, that the, Sept <laughs> that the Septuagint has glitches. Yeah, here's his phrase right here, but it has glitches. He didn't bother to mention that his, uh, that the, um, preferred Hebrew version also has huge glitches of its own. Like the fact that, uh, I don't need to go that far. Uh, where is it? Okay, Hebrew version, like the fact that Methuselah is flood stopped, like in the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch that we have Jared, Methuselah, and Lamech all being flood stopped, which is a huge problem. Um, so flood stoppage is a problem, especially where it's not noted in the text. And then you also have the uh, the plus, uh, flood series being way, way, way too shallow there. Uh, the pre-flood series is a little shallow as well, but the post-flood is really way too shallow, such that you have Shem outliving nine subsequent generations. That's a huge problem. There's no way that can be accurate. There's no reason to believe that that's accurate at all, but Bodhi doesn't mention that. Um, like I said, I agree with him in saying that we shouldn't push it all the way up to 10,000 years because that really would introduce more uh, people into the genealogy uh, than you could reasonably do. However, uh, like I said, it is very, very possible that the genealogy could be longer than that. And I went through and I actually did the textual research and the analysis and I found out that the date of creation could be somewhere around 5368, and that actually kind of depends on how you deal with some stuff with Noah, if um, that could be off by uh, a few years there, um, but not more uh, than, say, 70 years. So we'll say uh, 5300 on the low uh, side, uh, 5400 on the high side, and being the BC date which would put its um, creation somewhere between seven and 8,000 years ago. It's still not 10, that's true, but it is more than what Bodhi Hodge and Answers in Genesis would like to admit because they have pretty much blinded themselves to all contrary evidence. And then they're dealing with the textual variant in Luke 3, 30, 36 does not pay attention to how the New Testament genealogies work, that they have both a literal and a symbolic function that was well understood in history. And then they make mincemeat out of the textual data. They pull from an outdated source that has only one bit of evidence in its favor. And that one bit of evidence is actually highly unreliable. And when they do include uh, the more modern evidence. They leave out the fact that it is only some of the evidence, that it's two out of six early manuscripts. That was kind of important, but that's not what's mentioned. It's just misleading, and it's frustrating. All right, so I've had my chance to vent, and you guys have been along for the ride. Uh, hopefully you'll get something out of this, and hopefully you'll appreciate the value of good, honest research when it comes to textual criticism and the need for doing 3 or research and for checking people. Uh, this is an area in which a lot of people just simply are not very well trained. And so to a large extent, I actually, I'm not all that mad with answers in Genesis. I am, but at the same time, I'm not. And that I understand that this is not their field of study. And lots of people abuse um, textual analysis because they're just simply not very familiar with it. It's frustrating that it happens. It's annoying that it happens. But at the same time, what do you expect? This is not something that we, re we regularly talk about. 
you know, from the pulpit on Sunday morning or in any other venue where Christians are at. So, of course, people are going to have misunderstandings about it, and they're going to use information improperly, and they're going to think that misrepresenting the evidence is somehow a defense of the Bible, like this has happened here. They're going to have wrong impressions about it because we don't talk about it enough. So that's my real point in all this. Yes, I'm ticked off with answers in Genesis because they do this, but the bigger problem is that we're not talking about this kind of stuff in the church often enough, and that's what I want to see change. Thank you very much for your time and attention. For those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, I pray that you come to an understanding of the true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.